capitalistic society. What does that mean? Capitalism is our way of life. The market system, its highest expression. Our media hypes it in quasi-religious terms, even if its impact is sometimes quite negative and even debated in classrooms. Can't we agree that capitalism is an economic system, a system for the production and distribution of things we need and want? I won't agree to that. Not until you say something about government, too. There has to be a legal basis for any economic system to operate. Most of us recognize we live in an inherently volatile system. Not problem-free, but so the conventional wisdom goes better than any alternative. Many still believe the free market is our salvation, even as our economy has crashed, brought down not just by greed, but calculated scams and schemes that flouted the intent of our laws, enriched a few, and devastated the economy, leading to a massive loss of jobs, homes, and personal wealth. In 2006, my film, In Debt We Trust, warned of a coming economic collapse. Listen, I think the next great economic crisis in this nation is going to be brought about by the debt load. It will create an economic crisis so deep that it will threaten us as a nation. I was called a doom Learn and gloomer, an alarmist. I want Dan to check that was just written another book called Plunder. I followed up with a book that came out before Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. Speaking on Wall Street, I called for a jailout, not a bailout. I used to think of Wall Street as a financial center. I now think of it as a crime scene. Now it's time to make the case for why the financial crisis is a crime story. And I'm not the only one who sees it this way. Nomi Prinz was a managing partner at Bear Stearns and Goldman Sachs. This is the most expensive takeout, the biggest crime in, in, in world history. We're, we're talking about a crime we can't even quantify. You're talking double digit trillions of dollars minimum. This film will explore the scale of money's missing, written off, lost, ripped off in these various scams, and in the case of the bailout funds, unaccounted for. Graydon Carter, editor of Vanity Fair, may have summed it up best when he wrote, it can fairly be said that the chain of catastrophic bets made over the past decade by a few hundred bankers may well turn out to be the greatest nonviolent crime against humanity in history. They brought the world's economy to its knees, lost tens of millions of people their jobs and homes, and trashed the retirement plans of a generation. And they could drive an estimate 
estimated 200 million people worldwide into dire poverty. In other words, never before have so few done so much to so many. In one expert's estimate, the total money lost may reach $196.7 trillion, and that could be low. Like millions of Americans, I've lost thousands of dollars in retirement funds, and I haven't had it as bad as many. It's not just about them. It's about me, too. I have a stake in it, and like millions, I'm angry about the way our economy was wrecked. To help with our investigation, we spoke with convicted white-collar criminal Sam Antar. The white-collar criminal has no legal constraints. You subpoena documents, we destroy documents. You subpoena witnesses, we lie. So you, you are at a disadvantage when it comes to the white-collar criminal. In effect, we're economic predators. To an investigative reporter on the business beat, Wall Street steals far more than the mafia, says Gary Weiss. Wall Street uh, takes large, much larger sums of money than were involved in the mafia scams. The regulatory system is such that they can get away with it. The lack of media scrutiny, the absence of regulation, the widespread illusion that markets and real estate could only go up created a casino mentality, an environment for successful fraudsters and white-collar criminals. Your Honor, for many years, up until my arrest on December 11, 2008, I operated a Ponzi scheme I knew what I was doing was wrong, indeed criminal. White collar crime on Wall Street has been underreported, except for a very few high profile cases, as when hundreds of reporters staked out a New York courthouse to report Bernie Madoff's admission of guilt in his Ponzi scheme. Millions and millions of dollars. They are also in the courtroom today. Many of them incredibly angry. I had an IRA worth 1.3 million. My other monies was about 1.8 million, and it's gone. How, how do you think he got away with this for so long? How a person can run a scam for so many years without being detected? That was one of the things I thought of. Can't be a scam. Nobody can successfully run a scam for that long. Madoff was not alone. Regulators are now investigating scores of similar crimes. They say there is a pandemonium underway. There's four levels in every white-collar crime. There's the guy that gives the orders, the people that take the orders, the people that knew what was going on but didn't participate, and the people that should have known what was going on, like boards of directors or auditors, but didn't participate too. What they try to do is they try to get to the culpability of the guy at the top by working from the bottom. The problem that you have in the Bernie Madoff case is they got the guy at the top first, and he's protecting the other three layers on underneath him. On Wall Street, um, a lot of the extraction tends to be very borderline legal because the people extracting tend to be the ones setting up the legal framework. Rogue economics is what Loretta Napoleoni calls it in her new book. Well, the reason why the line between what is criminal and what is not criminal has disappeared is because of deregulization. But when you remove all the restriction, when you remove all the controls, uh, then, of course, what is legal and what is illegal. So you're, you're creating a crime scene and you're creating the crime and you're effectively buying the police officers all at the same time, only in the form of a regulatory body or a politician for the laws that work for Wall Street. In June 2009, the FBI said it was investigating 1,300 securities fraud cases, including many Ponzi schemes, as well as more than 580 corporate fraud cases. Most of these cases got little attention, but the media loves arch criminals like financier Bernard Madoff. These are complicated white-collar crimes of which the government does not have the resources to thoroughly prosecute, and the white-collar criminals know it. So they set it up not as a single transaction that's a crime, but a series of transactions that 
once it's all put together, makes it a crime. But to do that, you have to go beyond the prosecution of one wrongdoer and look at the way Wall Street itself became a Ponzi scheme. You have to examine a pattern, a system of criminality, which brought the investment and real estate worlds together in a multi-trillion dollar scam. To simplify, there were three interconnected rings in this circus involving the biggest firms in the industry. It started in the real estate business, where our desire for homes, the American dream, was turned into a scheme. First, predatory subprime lending over years got people into mortgages they couldn't afford and that the lenders knew they couldn't sustain. It was enabled by artificially low interest rates, with financing providing Provided by 25 of the top banks in the country. The second component of the crime involved what happened next. When the biggest banks and investment houses on Wall Street bought and then securitized loans as structured financial products. These mortgage bundles would be sold worldwide without full disclosure of their lack of underlying assets or the risks. The banks that bought these derivative products failed to do due diligence, relying on Trading agencies that overvalued their worth and accounting firms that did not do their job. The whole process was corrupt to the core. Finally, the third level of this interconnected but decentralized criminal enterprise involved insuring these often fraudulent practices, in some cases betting against them by the very people who sold them to guarantee that they would be protected when borrowers who couldn't afford the loans defaulted. They used insurance companies like AIG. Put these three criminal components together and a pattern emerges, a pattern of financial crime. I want a man who's a mortgage lender, oozing assurance and dripping wet. The financial crisis started because people could no longer afford to make payments on their subprime mortgage loan. This is a ghost town right now, a ghost street. All of these properties have been foreclosed. All of them. Did you see anyone on this street? Nobody lives here. Nobody wants to rent here. The housing crisis hit America like a tsunami, destroying neighborhoods and costing millions of families their homes. That has been foreclosed. This one for clothes, this one for clothes, for clothes, I'm everything. I'm a session, you're my bailout man. How did it happen? Why did so many top banks lend to some of the poorest members of society in a practice known as subprime lending, featuring loans like the one called Ninja? No income, no jobs, no assets, apparently no problem. The reason, higher fees up front and billions more when mortgages were turned into securities resold by Wall Street. I'm a person that's trying to save my house. Uh, I'm in foreclosure right now. Um, I feel like someone's hands in my pocket and I just like a fair break, a fair shake uh, and the American dream. Most of the world is sleeping. They're not aware of all the ins and outs of buying a house and, and all. They're not attorneys. They, they don't know and we don't know. And it's, we, it's really up to the guys that do know. They should be helping us, the pe people that don't know. And, but, but the sad thing is, they're doing just the opposite. They're taking advantage of our lack of understanding. 60% of the subprime borrowers could have qualified for less costly prime rates, but most were told their homes would go up in value. Many accepted onerous terms to give their families a piece of the American dream. Many lulled into believing they could afford houses with no money down and low introductory interest rates, watched the cost of adjustable rate mortgages or arms shoot up. When I first got it, I got a 1% introductory loan. Then my mortgage came down. The second month, it went up to 7.9. Oh. And now it's up to 9.9. .9. And it just keeps on going up. If I'm paying $2,800, a month for my home, I want to live next to J-Lo. 
and Mark Anthony. Not, not where I live. We should not have to leave our homes, our dream, I mean, even our shelters because of, you know, the rates are going up so high and we don't even understand why it's going up. It's going in somebody's pocket, but not ours. It should have been no surprise to anyone. Fraudulent lending practices resulted in a steep rise in foreclosures beginning in late 2006. Some of the biggest subprime lenders themselves later declared bankruptcy. In the news media, homeowners took most of the blame. It was said they had exercised a failure of personal responsibility. Irresponsible borrowing was stigmatized. Irresponsible lending was not. If you say that people made bad decisions, right? Well, maybe you can argue that 5,000 5, people made bad decisions, or 10,000, or 100,000. But when it gets to a million people making bad decisions, and then five million people making bad decisions, and 10 million people making bad decisions, because now we're over 10 million people at risk of foreclosure. At some point, it turns from making a bad decision because there is a scheme out there. There is a home ownership deception scheme out there. <laughs> Enter the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The FBI describes its responsibility for investigating financial and mortgage fraud on its website. It is called Mortgage Fraud and Epidemic. They're calling it Operation Malicious Mortgage. The FBI unveiled the results of a three and a half month probe into mortgage related fraud. FBI Director Robert Mueller. Through this operation, more than 400 defendants have been charged and we have obtained 173 convictions in crimes that accounted for more than one billion dollars in estimated losses. The FBI first warned of this fraud epidemic in 2004, reporting also though that their corporate crime units had been downsized to join the fight against terrorism. Some criminal cases are reported in the press, but not all are prosecuted, with companies often paying fines rather than facing a judge or a jury. Goldman Sachs paid $60 million to settle a subprime complaint the Massachusetts authorities said they had designed mortgages to fail. And they paid $60 million, but they did not admit any guilt. That's standard. It's standard when Wall Street firms negotiate um, what are, in effect, plea bargains with regulators for them not to admit guilt. According to an investigation by the Center for Public Integrity, 25 of the sleaziest subprime lenders were backed by the biggest banks in the United States. Citigroup, Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Bank of America. Together, the Financial Times reported they originated $100 billion in subprime mortgages between 2005 and 2007, almost three quarters of the total. What I did in the mortgage industry, I first got involved in about 1998. I was a, uh, a loan originator. And uh, during that time, what I had seen was nothing short of amazing in terms of, it was very predatory. The techniques that were being used, the, the, the salesmanship that was being used, the gimmicks on the loans and how they were structured, uh, it really disturbed me. The catch all to this and how they could get away with that is people hear full disclosure. Depending on the lending institution you went to, in other words, a bank, a broker, or a lending institution, all three are different. All three have different sets of regulations that govern them. And so full disclosure wasn't necessarily important to the loan itself. Just get them to sign on the dotted line. If they were happy with the numbers, you have a loan. And my name is Mo Bedard. I'm with LongSafe. Basically what we do is when someone's having mortgage issues and several other issues, but what I want to do is show the signature of Edna. What we're finding out is 80% of the people don't even know they have violations on their loans. This is the signature on her HUD-1, basically, which is right here. And then they have this signature here, which is her actual signature. 
which shows a completely different signature. It doesn't take, to me, an expert to figure out that there's something terribly wrong here. Someone gets a set, a set of loan docs, and they're usually probably two to three inches thick. There might be 15 or 20 really pertinent disclosures that borrowers need to worry about, okay? And they're buried in there, and they don't know what they're signing. Usually, they'll send out a notary to sign the loan with them at loan signing. And the notary usually has no clue of what is in that loan. And it's all part of the scheme, we like to call it. And then we, we go up here, we start looking at white out and then we have a consultant fee um, when you see a consultant fee on a mortgage um, that should set off red flags there's not really any consultants on a, on a mortgage or a sale it should have been one fee to rise mortgage this mark murphy is apparently someone we need to investigate and find out exactly who he is and why he got seventy eight hundred dollars on this loan these people basically fraudulently took this woman's home that she's been living in for over 15 years and thinking that it's hers, where it was actually never was hers since 1993. The, the fraud and deception that was built into these transactions was a necessary part of the transaction in order to generate the profits. Wall Street doesn't do mortgage lending. What Wall Street did was package, sell, repackage, and resell mortgages, making what was a small housing bubble a gigantic housing bubble, and making what became an American financial problem very much a global financial problem. Welcome to Wall Street Today. Economist Max Wolf, who works in the financial industry, is our tour guide. You're looking at people who've gone through 10 unthinkable low probability events in a four month period when every time you think you can catch a breather, there's another leg down. Atmospheres on trading floors and in a lot of these firms are funereal. Friends are gone, bonuses are gone, futures are unsure. It's been very difficult. As we spoke on Wall Street, people wanted to get into the conversation. I mean, Most you know, were worried. I was, a, I was a bank examiner for 10 years, okay? And uh, I wonder where the regulators are to let Citicorp, I know they got an office in Citicorp's building year round. You know, where was the SEC? Where are all the guys that are supposed to be watching, you know, what's going on? And uh, I mean, when I was a bank examiner 20 years ago, you know, <clears throat> we had some crises in the late 80s, early 90s, you know, but we, we got our arms around it. Nobody got their arms around this. I just wonder if you think the average person in America really grasps the magnitude of the crisis that we're in. I hope they do, and I think it's an excellent question. My personal guess is no. My personal guess is they'd be much more angry and much more interested if they understand how much is on at play here. The destruction here is around the clock. You shred papers, you shred deals. All the money's been made at this point. All the takeout happened a couple years ago. Now you're just sort of looking at the remains of a very profitable time which will be followed by another very profitable time because the same people will still be involved in structuring the same types of things. Other People's Money is Prin's insider book on the subject. She helped create the investment vehicles used to package subprime loans. She now sees it as a criminal enterprise. The biggest crime in all of this is the thing that's the least able to be understood and examined um, by the FBI, by the Department of Justice, by anyone in Washington. The tiny, tiny lowest layer of the crisis that started with subprime defaulting um, at the homeowner borrower level. The money wasn't made there. The money was made because several layers up a pyramid, Wall Street investment firms and commercial bank investment groups decided to repackage those mortgages, create layers of them that they then resold to investors. Here's what happens. There are three defaults on mortgages. The bank that holds those sells those at 10 cents on the dollar to a second bank. That bank puts those together with three other defaults and three other defaults and makes a second package and sells it to a third bank. The third bank sells six of these things for kitchens and bundles them and sells them to some investor who has no idea what he has. They borrowed against those layers, which is the real crime. They would take a little piece of a layer of a security underneath which somewhere there was a bunch of home buyers, and they would take it and they would borrow 30 times the amount 
of money that it represented. Five big investment banks dominated Wall Street. It is they who took the subprime loans purchased from banks and packaged them as bundled investments to be sold worldwide. There were reports that there was what was called suction from Wall Street. In other words, Wall Street investment houses, as they began to make billions mm -hmm. on, on these securitized loans and CDOs and derivatives, were pressuring the mortgage people at the local level, give us more, give us more, give us more. Well, the, the reason why Wall Street was putting the pressure or the, the sucking sound that you referred to on, on the loan originators is because the profits that they were generating, when this whole concept first opened up and people realized the money that was to be made on the back end, trading the paper. They were essentially creating liquid cash from nothing. We're talking trillions of dollars. There's $14 trillion worth of asset backs with subprime and other types of mortgages and CDOs created between 2003 and 2007. $14 trillion were created on that. Investment houses and hedge funds and private equity funds could leverage 30, 40 times. Banks could leverage 15 to 20 times. Um, on average, they could only uh, leverage 13 times, but on certain securities... But that's more than the value of the whole country, of the whole gross domestic product. If you, on average, and this is a very conservative estimate, assume that the average leverage for the $14 trillion worth of asset backs and CDOs was 10 times, which to me is a conservative estimate. That's $140 trillion worth of nothing. If you lose the 14 trillion, the other 140 minus the 14 trillion doesn't exist. You, you have nothing, you have no collateral left to pay to the people that you borrowed money from, and it all falls down. The practice to sell mortgages to people who clearly can't afford it, so to target these people uh, in order to give them mortgages and then to use these mortgages to sell it back to the banks in order to create mortgage bank, bank security is a criminal practice for sure. And I think the bank that does that does have liability, civil and considerably in some cases criminal, but that liability arises when they sell that portfolio of mortgages to investors who believe they are getting safe, sound, secure mortgages. And there are very injured victims at that chain, uh, that end of the distribution chain, because I can direct you to school boards around the country that have lost almost their entire funds and have lost their pension funds. You sound angry. I, I am angry. I, I'm an investor, okay? I invested in, in some of these um, investment companies, and now I have to wait, holding my breath, hoping that um, I won't take such a large hit. So we can all be wiped out here. Yes, we all can be, okay? And, and left with nothing, and these guys are rewarded. And I would even say that this is racketeering because it took place between a group of real estate agencies and banks together. A lot of people made a lot of money, but when these homeowners defaulted in record numbers, the whole system became infected. I used to think that Freddie Mac was a pimp But now my mutual fund is the one walking with a limp And Fannie Mae, you almost failed me, boo But the faithful feds, they bailed you Y'all got the shaft. Shaft! The government said, good luck with that. Shaft! And AIG, old Uncle Sam, he loaned you 85 billion. But now he owns you. Who had brought down Wall Street? hedge funds. Back in 2007, with the boom still in full swing, my business partner Rory O'Connor attended this party just off Wall Street for traders under the age of 30. It reeked of affluence, shiny cars, 
and beautiful people. Hedge funds were like millionaire-only clubs, where ungodly sums could be invested in complicated vehicles in secret, outside the prying eyes of Wall Street regulators. Soon, all the traditional investment firms had their own hedge funds. No wonder so many of these young people wanted in, and at the top. I mean, I personally spent five years in private equity and then made the, the decision, instead of going back to business school, to move over to the public side. So that was a, a conscious decision on my part. I think most people probably get involved because there is an opportunity to move up the ranks and make more money at an earlier age in hedge funds than there is in private equity, which is the natural progression after a couple years in an investment banking program. Well, if you were going to be in, in the investment world, the best way to, and you're a, a good investor, the best way to make money is to have a hedge fund because you get compensated much, compensated much higher. Hedge funds were being paid 1% of the assets and 20% of the profits in those days. So obviously that was the best way to make money if you were any good at it. If you were good Investor Jim Rogers and a partner named George Soros started a fund because it was the thing to do. A hedge fund is someone who buys things and at the same time hedges himself by selling short. The problem is most people in the street don't understand selling short. Terms so like selling short, selling short and collateralized debt obligations and credit default swaps became the lingua franca of the industry. Nowhere was this more true than in unregulated hedge funds, each boasting its own super-secret, proprietary investment algorithm. They attempted to take the risk out of investing by putting large amounts of money in side bets. Wall Street began putting more money into gambles on the market than money in the market. Yeah, but right now, everybody's doing it. It's normal. Think everybody's great. Everybody's making a lot of money. But when the thing starts unwinding, then people are going to say, I, I never did that, or I don't know how we did it. it was, uh, my lawyer said it was okay. And you know what? The lawyers are saying it's okay. My accountant said it's okay, and the accountants are saying it's okay. Everybody's in the game right now. But it's always happened this way. And eventually, it always pops, and eventually, everybody suffers. There's a fine, fine line between a bull and a bear. And there's a fine, fine line between delight and despair. I'm hoping I'll avoid the pain to come from trades yet to unwind. Insurance company AIG was a leading seller of credit derivatives. So a bank, for example, like Goldman Sachs, would create a CDO. It would stick all kinds of subprime loans and, and, and packages, packages and packages of them into a package, and then it would go off to AIG, and AIG had a AAA rating, a pristine credit rating, and Goldman would say, you know what, you take this package of junk we've just created and kind of insure it. You basically write a default swap to us. You basically credit insure it. You've got a much better rating than we do, so our investors will buy it from you with that insurance. You make money, we make money, everybody's happy. Former bank regulator William Black told Bill Moyers this was all deliberate. Th this stuff, the, the exotic stuff that you're talking about, was created out of things like liar's loans that were known to be extraordinarily bad. And... Now it was getting triple A ratings. Now a triple A rating is supposed to mean there is zero credit risk. So you take something that not only has significant, it has crushing risk. That's why it's toxic. And you create this fiction that it has zero risk. That itself, of course, is a fraudulent exercise. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? AIG made guarantees totaling more than their ability to pay, an amount larger than the entire value of the company. Actually, that's a bit of an understatement. AIG, along with others who sold derivatives, had insured their policyholders to the tune of an estimated $596 trillion. Compare this to the gross national product of the entire world, and the problem should become more obvious. So you were just gambling billions, possibly trillions of dollars 
well, I, I wouldn't refer to it as, as gambling. I would, you know, uh, these uh, these transactions were individu individually underwritten, uh, very carefully, uh, and maybe I, I can provide some more background to you that may be helpful. If, if they're very, if they were carefully underwritten, how come no one wants to buy them? How could AIG have possibly expected to make good on its promises? One thing we know for sure, AIG executives made huge paychecks selling these credit derivatives to hedge funds and others right up until the economy caved. So we don't need to fear hedge funds? I don't think you need to fear hedge funds. I think hedge funds provide um, a pretty intelligent investor base, a more savvy investor base for the market. I love Subprime, it's my kind of play. Wall Street used to invest in the American economy in companies that used its money to produce goods and services. But then Wall Street became the American economy. Our financial system was re-engineered through what's been called financialization, with banks, credit cards, real estate, and insurance companies as the new power players. Capitalism has sort of gone off the rails. It ceased to be capital. It's financialization. The fact that it's now all about speculation, the fact that it's about Ponzi schemes, the fact that it's about selling and buying paper from an economy of real goods, real commodities, and real services to a system where people were buying and selling money, buying and selling assets, buying and selling other firms, where no new value was created. Mo Sasserby says the whole system has gone predatory. I think we had a transition from what truly was a free market system to something now that is out of control and probably what I would uh, define as a predatory system. Frequently markets that are manipulated for the uh, end of maybe a few out there, few investors, mega investors, it's even, even that's very difficult to tell. We still don't know who in fact is making money while so many in fact are losing money on Wall Street right now. There's something rotten in Denmark. Some rotten in Spain, some rotten in Washington, it ain't ever gonna change. And all I wanna know, what became of the little guy? As Business Week noted, what we're observing in all of its bizarreness is the ancient paradox of what happens when an irresistible force meets an immovable object. The irresistible force in this case is the U.S. economy. The immovable object is a wall of debt that now can't be paid back. We're in a position where the volume of debt, mortgage debt, corporate debt, personal debt, and even state and local debt is larger than the ability to pay. The rise of a credit-based economy fueled a growing disparity between rich and poor. Wealth was transferred from the middle class to the upper class. The middle class watched its savings literally drop to nothing. As every spare dollar went into paying off borrowed money, the upper class, meanwhile, figured out how to make money from money, or more accurately, how to sell their debt, a promise to pay in the future. Real estate expert Ron Silverman calculates the cost. You are talking in recent years of a problem that every year transfers hundreds of billions of dollars. Hundreds of billions? Hundreds of billions of dollars. You said billions. I said billions, not millions, from the pockets of the poor to people who are far better positioned than their so-called victims ago, uh, the upper 1% of the population owned 30% of uh, America's returns to wealth, that is, dividends, interest, and capital gains. Five years ago, they'd raised their proportion from 37% to 57%, and today it's estimated that the upper 1% of America's population uh, owns almost 70% of the returns to uh, 
uh, to 70%? wealth. 70%? 70%. That's huge. Yes, it is. It's unprecedented. It's, essentially, it makes America look like a third world banana republic. Angry homeowners marched down Park Avenue and into the lobby of Bear Stearns. Ironically, Bear Stearns was also in debt. The billions of dollars they received in the bailout did not go to the company's shareholders, but to those to whom they owed money. It was a deal that ultimately uh, saved the, uh, the creditors uh, to Bear Stearns by forcing it into J.P. Morgan at the expense of equity holders. Michael Hudson points out that both the homeowners and corporate America are now in hock to the debt machine. Cor uh, many corporations are effectively in negative equity uh, or in a technically insolvent position uh, headed by the financial sector, by the banks themselves. Is there any sympathy for the demonstrators in the building, you think? Uh, I don't know if there's a lot of sympathy, per se, to, to their point of view. I mean, we were, you know, in, in a similar, similar boat, so to speak. A similar boat, perhaps, but only one had life preservers. Look at the fact that the government now is funneling money uh, to a major bank and saying, if you can do that with a bank, why not do it? with uh, strapped homeowners facing foreclosure as Democrats. Bail out working women and men who worked hard to buy their homes. That's who you need to bail out if there's any bailout to be as had. As the crisis increases desperation on all sides, Hudson says Wall Street is waging war on Main Street in a battle for survival. We are seeing an econ a class war in this country such as you've never seen in the entire history of the United States. A class war. A class war, except in this case, the class war isn't the kind of war that Marxists and socialists talked about. It's not between employers and employees because employment's going to be shrinking. Half of Bear Stearns' 14,000 employees would eventually be laid off by J.P. Morgan Chase. And look, any of the Bear Stearns employees, you're welcome to join us. Yes, sir. Sure. You're going to be in our situation. Bring everybody from down that end of the lobby over here. It's a class war between creditors and debtors. It's going to be a fight between the financial sector and the, what's called the real economy, the economy of production and consumption. And the financial sector has prepared itself and positioned itself uh, to come out on top by being able not only to foreclose on the property of debtors, but to get a government bailout for all of its losses. a dream everybody have a chance to get the dream it's not just one class or one race and at this point nobody's getting that piece of dream at all employment is going to go down markets are going to shrink people are going to default even more on their uh, mortgage debts on their credit card debt on their student loans so you're going to have an exponentially rising trend of defaults you're going to see a transfer of property from debtors to creditors. A depression? Not only a depression, but an economic polarization. It sounds bad. Yes, it's very bad. The media was now out in force covering the protests. Many homeowners would not talk to them. Would anybody like to get their voice out to CNBC so everybody can hear what you're protesting right now? A CNBC reporter turned to me when others were silent. So why do you think people don't want to talk to you? Because they hate you. They think the media is part of the problem. They, they don't think that you're going to help them. They think you're going to help their skirt. Tonight of what's been called the worst financial crisis in modern times. Certainly Where was the media when all this was going on? Why were there so few warnings and investigations in what was to become an economic catastrophe? Things are, are only going to get worse. We want to talk a little bit more. You've been incredibly pessimistic. August 2007 marked the beginning of the end of an era. What had gone up was now coming down. Foreclosures were up 93% from the year before. In London, there was a run on Northern Rock Bank. More bank write-downs followed. Billions at UBS and Citigroup. Fannie Mae, the largest source for home loans, reported a 3.55 
billion dollar loss for the fourth quarter. In March 2008, the fifth largest investment bank in the world, Bear Stearns was on the verge of collapse. Many of the nation's most okay. respected right. financial Should journalists were Stearns still getting it wrong. Get my money out of there. No, no, no. Bear Stearns is fine. Do not take your money out. This is really, look, if there's one takeaway other than a plus 400 somebody, Bear Stearns is not in trouble. I mean, if anything, they're more likely to be taken over. Don't move your money from Bear. That's just being silly. Don't be silly. The media was complicit, says Dean Starkman, a financial journalist now with the Columbia Journalism Review. The business press, former colleagues of mine, friends of mine, did not really recognize and understand what they were up against, how dramatically the, the world had changed, the lending industry had changed, things that you've kind of documented, how um, out of control Wall Street had become. And I think it's a real contributing factor, factor to, to how we got to where we are today. Starkman even compares the journalists who cover Wall Street to reporters sent to Iraq. He said they too were embedded, but in the corporate culture. The, uh, the great panic of 2008 is the equivalent uh, for the business media what the Iraq war was from the, for the Washington press corps. This is the financial story of, of the last 70 years. So the parallel is fair. You could further extend the analogy a little bit to think about the idea, this concept of being embedded, that the press corps itself was sort of embedded within a particular narrative that has its origins on, on Wall Street. I don't think that analogy is, is out of whack at all. There was one more factor that few in the media covered because it was about the media, about the infusion of nearly $3 billion in advertising revenues from dodgy lenders and credit card companies. Between 2002, when the housing bubble took off, until its crash in 2007. Essentially, an entire industry became predatory. Predatory, like criminal? Um, yeah, deceptive marketing on a mass scale as a... As a as a, um, a function of corporate policy. It started in America and is now everywhere. Some say the United States has infected the world with a kind of financial AIDS. The people who these mortgages were sold to, a large majority of these people were poor, black, or, or Latino people. In other words, this was targeting minorities, especially. So this resulted in the biggest transfer of wealth from the poorest people in America to the richest institutions in the world. Alors, le, le résultat de ça, c'est un transfert de, de, de wealth, de, de, de richesse, des plus pauvres vers les institutions bancaires et les plus riches aux États-Unis. I think that the majority of people, they, they feel that this is a problem for, as you say, this is, this is a banking problem, this is a stock market problem, these are investment problems. From the European side, uh, it's interesting being here because as the gentleman says, things are much more controlled here. But I got a, a bank loan to get my house. They really made sure I had the money. There was no way I could have gotten a subprime loan here in France and never been able to pay it back and a bank would have benefited from that. I'm a graduate student of a business school in Belgium. I'm uh, doing an internship right now in a uh, Belgium bank uh, that has been nationalized. People are uh, scared of losing their jobs because they don't know um, what's going to happen next. How do people here feel about the whole subprime lending? Isn't it amazing? People were given money and didn't have any assets. I think they just uh, looked at the short-term benefits of, uh, of the subprime uh, secur securitization and, and all those things. And uh, they didn't look at uh, uh, long-term uh, stability, long-term profits. I think that America is heading for a really deep crisis of untold proportions. Mm -hmm. You have, a, you have a, a deep ideological and cultural division. You're going to have, I don't see that how they're going to avoid massive unemployment. You have extreme wealth and extreme poverty, and you have an armed population. That's not the case here. 
I think that what we're going to see in the United States, I hope I'm wrong, but I think the United States is heading towards an abyss. As the crisis worsened, politicians finally woke up to realize that the economy they had deregulated was imploding. Congress was finally being asked to act. Ironically, the pitch was made by a Republican, Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson, a former CEO of Goldman Sachs, in the years that that firm made massive profits in housing securitization and speculation. We must do so in order to avoid a continuing series of financial institution failures and frozen credit markets that threaten American families' financial well-being, the viability of businesses both small and large, and the very health of our economy. The question, would government intervention fix the problem or make it worse? Would it reward the companies that profited from massive fraud, or would it lead to more fraud? Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson and Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke began a push for what might be called the final plunder. The real story was not widely known, except through one interview on C-SPAN. Look, I was there when the Secretary and the uh, Chairman of the Federal Reserve came those days and talked with members of Congress about what was going on. On Thursday at about 11 o'clock in the morning, the Federal Reserve noticed a tremendous drawdown of money market accounts in the United States to the tune of $550 billion. We were having an electronic run on the banks. Their estimation was that by 2 o'clock that afternoon, $5.5 trillion would have been drawn out of the money market system of the United States, would have collapsed the entire economy of the United States, and within 24 hours, the world economy. A shell-shocked Congress was given a three-page plan. In essence, it gave Paulson total control to spend $700 billion. Some saw it as a power grab. Others saw the deliberate creation of a crisis to push through a corporate agenda. Control the media enough to ensure that the public will not notice that this bailout will indebt them for generations. What was unique was the refusal of Congress to hear any testimony from expert witnesses or to have hearings. A billion dollar bailout for Wall Street is being driven by fear, not fact. This is too much money in too short a time going to too few people while too many questions remain unanswered. Why aren't we having hearings on the plan we just received? Why aren't we questioning the underlying premise of the need for a bailout with taxpayers' money? Why have we not even considered any alternatives other than to give $700 billion to Wall Street? Why aren't we asking Wall Street to clean up its own mess? Why aren't we passing new laws to stop the speculation which triggered this? Why aren't we putting up new regulatory structures to protect the investors? How do we even value the $700 billion in toxic assets? Why aren't we directly helping homeowners with their debt burden? Why aren't we helping American families faced with bankruptcy? Why aren't we reducing debts for Main Street instead of Wall Street? Isn't it time for fundamental change in our debt-based monetary system so we can free ourselves from the manipulation of the federal Re by the Federal Reserve and the banks? Is this the United States Congress or the Board of Directors of Goldman Sachs? Congressman Kucinich's remarks were not widely reported either. They were still refusing to make new loans. The oversight of Paulson's program was criticized because millions could not be accounted for. Fraud is deceit. And the essence of fraud is I create trust in you and then I betray that trust and get you to give me something of value. And as a result, there's no more effective acid against trust than fraud, especially fraud by top elites. And that's what we have. Although all the facts are not in about who got how much and under what terms, many in the public see the bailouts as a way to loot taxpayers, as fraudulent as the problems they were addressing. Yeah, we're, we're on our way to Capitol Hill. 
By the summer of 2009, the crisis had not abated. Unemployment continued to climb, foreclosures to mount, bankruptcies to grow, markets to shrink, firms to fold, and tensions to tear apart families and communities. I think you will see a bunch of people get indicted and get some prison sentences. More importantly, and the bigger question to me is, will we see a structural change or will we go through a long, bad recession while we waste our money struggling to rebuild an unsustainable system that should have never been erected in the first place? As new regulations were beginning to be put in place, trillions had been spent by government on stimulus programs. These measures were clearly not enough. So-called reforms often pumped money into the very institutions that caused the problems. The bailouts benefited the wealthy. Deficits and debt grew by the trillions. It became clear that the structure of our economy has yet to be transformed. In June 2009, President Obama announced new financial reforms, saying the crisis was caused by mistakes. By not recognizing the government's inability to police Wall Street, investor Jim Chano says his reforms are doomed to fail. And it's a little bit tough because uh, the, the guys who are the bad guys are one step ahead of, uh, of the cops on the beat every single time. For starters, we need a full investigation, like the one that followed the great crash of 1929. We need to know who benefited from one of the most insidious crimes in history. How did Wall Street's wizards engineer this disaster? And who is complicit with them? Will the big fish ever be prosecuted? The media, too, has to wake up to shift the debate to include the need for deeper change and a crackdown on white-collar crime. Since this is my film, I get the last word. This financial crisis will not be turned off like a light switch. Millions are struggling to survive as conditions get worse. Well, you have to get your bills straight. You have to pay them. How can we pay them if the mortgage is sucking everything we got? How can we do it? It's impossible. I began this film with a call to investigate the wrongdoers, the crimes behind the crisis. So we need a jailout, not just a bailout. People should be angry. When the money was being made, when the securities were being created, there was a lot of partying, there was a lot of backslapping, there was a lot of extraction. A lot of extraction should lead to a major reaction. Will an age of wonder usher in an age of major structural change, or will there have to be an age of protest and pitchforks first? Uh, we are here to see, see the center, please. These issues of economic justice must be addressed on the air and off, in the media and in the streets. I've been trying, but I can't do it alone. Now it's your turn. The shine on America's shoes got gold When Wall Street stepped into the fold Congress paid off, workers laid off Stanford, AIG, and Madoff Credit swaps, credit stops Empty wallets and empty shops Dead bank walking the AAA Grandpa knows his 401k One shoe drops, the other shoe drops. One parachute drop, the head of the cops. Overprivileged, overpaid, high cash too easily made. Easy credit for easy crime, American dream, death by subprime. on every trade the mirror flatters the razor sharp on the company jet tooting up the tarp master 
masters of the universe, the master's voice. Greed is the greed, the drug of choice. Toxic assets, the master plan. Greed, the asset of the toxic man.